Oh my god, I hope I'm live. I think I'm live on YouTube again. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome back to the Astro Coffee Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell, and I am happy to be back on Thursdays at 3 o'clock to stream whatever we want to stream about. But, you, but I'm going to try and be more uh, coherent in the content that we have. And let me know how I'm coming through, by the way, on this audio. I'm hoping everything's all right on this. Um, I have to crank up this level just a little bit more. But um, anyway, it's been a while since we've been streaming. And today is my inaugural stream for 2020. The Astro Coffee Hangouts are going to be starting up again today. And I'll be doing them every Thursday for at 3 o'clock Eastern Time Uh from here on out. The format's going to be a little bit different than what you're used to. I've had to make some adjustments to the streaming. And so it's um, it's going to be a little bit of slightly different format than what we have before. I can't look at the chat right now because it's very distracting. <laughs> so uh, we'll be back. Uh, there'll be primarily Astro Coffee Hangouts, although we do have a few Future in Space Hangouts coming up. Uh, that are be sponsored by the American Astronautical Society. Uh, this one is not. So we'll, the ones that are, though, will be clearly labeled and branded as such. So today, we're going to be talking with, or I am going to be showing you, I should use correct words here, the pre-recorded interview that I did with Dr. Brian Keating. He is a professor of physics at the University of uh, Ca California at San Diego. He may even be watching this. I'm not sure. He might be in the live chat. Uh, but he is also the author of a book called Losing the Nobel Prize, a story of cosmology, ambition, and the perils of science's mightiest honor. And he's got a, he, he was a member, a founding member of the BICEP and the BICEP2 teams, which you may remember back in 2017, made an extraordinary claim uh, about the uh, polarized light of the cosmic microwave background. He's gonna, we're going to talk about what that science was. It turned out to be a little bit premature. And so he talks about what that experience was like. Uh, for him, and he, and he also describes, uh, he wrote the, whole, the book about it as well. So what late last year, back when things were really crazy when it came to streaming and what hangouts were going to be scheduled, I had no idea what was going on. I talked to Brian via Zoom meeting and recorded it. And I've been sitting on it because things have been just like I said, you know, up in the air as far as what the Hangouts were doing. I even had to get another job so I could pay uh, pay the bills. So I couldn't do this very much for a long time. So now that I'm back, the first thing I want to do is get this interview out there. We're going to, I've scheduled on February 13th. He will be back live with us to do, to talk on the live chat. So here's how today's going to work. I'm going to do this introduction like I've just done. And I'm going to play the interview, but I'm going to be on the live chat. Uh, so I'll be there. Well, I'll answer questions and comment. I'll comment along with you. And then I'll come back after the interview is over. We'll chat a little bit more, things like that. Uh, after this airs, early next week, I'm going to post the audio of this onto my Deep Astronomy podcast. Uh, so if you are subscribed to Deep Astronomy, you can listen to this again uh, in, in that format if you don't have time to watch this entire hangout. And But there are some visuals here, so you might want to uh, watch this as well. But I just want to let you know that this audio will get posted early next week onto the Deep Astronomy podcast. And let's see. There are links in the description. There's links to uh, Brian's book. Uh, but I invite you to check it out. Brian also has a YouTube channel. I've listed that down there as well. So subscribe to his channel. And um, I'll be with you in the live chat. So we'll we'll talk together uh, once this, uh, while this is going on and also when it's over. So again, to summarize, thank you guys. Welcome back. It's good to be back streaming on YouTube again. If you want a more, um, if you want a more <laughs> less structured, uh, hang out, then we also do T cubed, which is Tony's Twitch Tuesday on Twitch at three o'clock on Tuesday, same time. Uh, so check it out there. Basically it's going to become uh, it's more just a time, chance for us to hang out together and talk about astronomy. So that's also there. I invite you to check it out on Twitch. All right. So let's get, let me get started here. Let me push the right buttons and uh, I'll, I'll be in the chat and I'll come back as soon as this recording is done. Hey, Brian. Well, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome, Brian, to our 
a humble little hangout here. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Brian Keating. He's a Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Physics at the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences at the University of California at San Diego. And he's also the author of the book, Losing the Nobel Prize. So Brian, first I want to tell us a little bit about yourself, and then I'd like to ask you about how your book came to be published. So tell us a little bit about yourself first. Yeah, well, as you said, I'm an astronomer, astrophysicist, and professor at the University of California. I've been here about 16 years. I can hardly believe it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I never thought as a kid you could be a professor of astronomy or physics. You know, I thought it was like uh, being an ice cream taster or a wizard or something like that. that <laughs> no one would pay you to do something I would do for free. But, you know, thankfully, my uh, governor and the regions continue to pay me. <clears throat> and um, what I get to do is really nothing less than work with the most intelligent human beings who have ever existed on all seven continents around the world, looking for invisible astronomical signals, invisible that is to the naked eye. And we're trying to make the, visible, the invisible visible using technology that dates back, in some cases, you know, 400 years back to when Galileo invented this, little, or didn't invent, but used this humble little refracting telescope to observe the universe for the very first time. Right. And so you work in a field uh, of, of cosmology where you're trying to understand the origins and the large scale structure of the universe itself, which is a huge and amazing science. And uh, when you say you're trying to, to look at this in other wavelengths, what wavelengths, what's your specific interest? I saw as I was uh, doing some research on you before talking that you were a part of, and I think you have something to say about the Biceps 2, or Bicep 2 mission. Yeah, uh, which what, right. tell us tell us a little bit about the Bicep Two mission, what it was designed to look at, and also what are the wavelengths in which you're primarily interested in at looking. Yeah, at. so what I study uh, for those of you who uh, cannot see the video, I study the cosmic microwave background. Oh, I love that. Where did you get that? <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, this is a stuffed animal. I my kids sometimes let me borrow. Uh, you can get it from this uh, this outfit called Particle Zoo. Oh, Part I know about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So, so he's holding up, for those of you who listen to the podcast, he's holding up a little stuffed animal, I believe it or not, of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, that's right. The remnants of the Big Bang. It's awesome. Yeah, this is the heat <laughs> left over from the formation of the very first elements, hydrogen, helium, uh, lithium, etc. <clears throat> right. And then after that, the elements that are made uh, that we find on Earth that we're made of really come from starlight. And stars that have exploded in the past history of our universe, and I'll talk a little bit about that and how that actually impacts our study of the early universe, which we're trying to use not visible light like a normal telescope uses or your eyeballs, which are really two refracting telescopes used, but instead we're using microwaves. This is a form of radiation, longer wavelength than infrared radiation, uh, shorter wavelength than radio waves. And these are waves that are thought to or known to have emanated from the formation of the first elements and the earliest structures in the universe when it was about 380,000 years old. And what we're trying to do with that light is use the light as a type of film. It sounds weird for your uh, listeners out there, viewers who are old enough to remember film. Film used to be the substance that you'd expose. Let me see if I can find a picture. There's some pictures I have in, the, in my office here that were taken by the great astronomer, uh, Margaret Burbage, and um, she is one of the founders of optical astronomy, the pioneers of dark matter discovery, etc. Um, uh, I can go and grab a slide of hers that, that I happen to be blessed to have here at the University of California, San Diego. And what we're doing is we're using this light from the Big Bang as a type of film to expose waves of not light, but gravity. So waves of gravity, it's called gravitational radiation are produced when I you know, shake my fist at the television screen, when I see something I don't like. Anytime you have matter in motion, it produces waves of gravity. Anytime you have electric charges in motion, it produces waves of light. So in the early universe, it's possible that both were present in great quantities, matter in motion, and, uh, and in fact, the reverberations of space-time itself may have been the plausible origin of a type of signal that we use our detectors located at the South Pole the one the subject of my book is called uh, Bicep 2. And this uh, discussion uh, that I have in the book is how we thought we had glimpsed the earliest baby picture of the co infant cosmos. But in reality, we ended up glimpsing a signal much more prosaic and closer to home, though still astronomical. And that or or originates not in the formation of the first elements in the Big Bang, but rather the formation of the heavy elements and stars in our galaxy. Right now, were you a member of the Bicep 2 team? 
I was, yes, I was a founding yeah. member of it. I had okay. created the bicep one experiment, which was the predecessor that kicked off this whole field of study, so to speak. What does bicep stand for again? It's an acronym. Bicep was an acronym that I made up uh, and it stands for background imaging of cosmic extragalactic polarization. And the reason it's sort of a play on words, and I was proud of myself back then uh, for inventing it. <laughs> it's hard it. to get a good acronym. It is. It is. It is. And, and since then, the leadership has chosen just to say it's a name, but, but I'll always call it BICEP uh, for the <laughs> acronym. And that's because we're looking for a type of signal that would represent a swirling, curling pattern of microwaves that would be indicative of these first, uh, of these first formation of these gravitational waves in the early universe. And as the bicep is the muscle that does curls at the gym, so too would this bicep telescope reveal curls and do the heavy lifting of revealing what the cosmos would look like in the earliest trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after it came into existence. And specifically, though, it was designed to look for polarized signals, if I remember right. correctly. That's exactly and right. pol a polarized light, for those just real quick, is uh, is a is a is when at least with electromagnetic waves, it is when the uh, uh, the direction of the electric field is in a in, in a uh, one directional pattern instead of sure. being all over the place, and and it is generally. Uh, detected because the the electric field is also polarized so is the magnetic field at the magnetic component and you can see this polarized light uh, an example is a reflection off of a pond the light that comes off of a reflected surface is polarized right. but this was gravitational energy am I yes. right yes and you were looking for polarized gravitational waves at a time which I should mention, this is like back in March of 20, what was it, 2014 or something like that? You guys had made, tried to make the, were making your initial findings announced. This was before we found gravitational waves at all. That's right. That yeah, didn't absolutely. come until, until LIGO saw them in 2016. That's so right. that sounds amazing. You were looking for a subset of a signal, a polarized gravitational wave, correct? That's right. Yeah, the impact of the of the signal, if gravitational waves existed, would have been uh, sort of the implication would have been that a process called inflation took place. So we observe the universe expanding and galaxies moving away from each other at good fractions and sometimes greater than the speed of light. Uh, and that impulsion to expand we believe is related in some way or another to the original uh, expansion of the universe when it began its existence effectively, just as I said, a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the origin of the universe. And we observe this expansion and yet we don't know how it started, what kicked it off, what impelled the universe to begin expanding versus collapsing. After all, most of the energy and matter in the universe is gravitationally attractive. So why would the universe be expanding if most of the matter and gravity only works in one direction and acts to contract and cause things to coalesce? So the, uh, the notion that the universe began expanding is, is quite surprising, given that we have matter in the universe. And it led Einstein to, among other things, insert this famous cosmological constant into his equations of, of relativity. Right. Uh, but getting back to why we want to see polarization... Uh, you're exactly right. When light bounces off a lake or a pond or an ocean, it becomes polarized. And I've got these two polarizing grids here. So here's one. I'll hold it up to the camera and mm -hmm. you can barely see through me. Now, as I twist this other one, it will go through being parallel and then anti-parallel to the first one. And you'll actually see a pattern of repetition of light and dark patterns as these come into and out of alignment. So I can see you. I cannot see you. I can see you. And that polarization pattern is indicative of the way that light is interacting with matter. To get polarization of light, you need an anisotropic, a, a non-isotropic distribution of light, and you need some amount of electrons and matter in the universe to scatter that, that light, which is anisotropic. You need it to scatter, and then that will produce polarization, even if the light source was unpolarized to begin with. So the sun, the sun's light is unpolarized, but when it bounces off the Pacific Ocean here in San Diego, it becomes slightly polarized because it's anisotropic. It's not coming from all directions. That's a fancy word, by the way, for just irregular, right? I mean, it's just not Anisotropic the same. Anisotropic is irregular. It's yeah. coming in different amounts in different directions. It means right. not isotropic. Right. So isotropic would be if you're inside of a cloud, all the light is coming in equal directions. And even if you had a lot of electrons there, it would not scatter and produce polarization. Right. Now, what could have caused 
we know what caused the amount of electrons that were present in the early universe. That was the Big Bang. The Big Bang, the creation of the elements, the creation of hydrogen from, um, uh, from quarks, for example, that fusion process. We know how many, quark, how many electrons there were compared to protons, very equally balanced. But what we didn't know is the exact composition of what would cause the light to not be isotropic. And that is theorized to have a component of which produced by these inflationary gravitational waves. So the logic is, you see a specific twisting pattern of polarization. From that, you infer that there were gravitational waves present when the CMB was produced, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And from that, you surmise that the universe began in a period of inflation. And if you want to go even further back than that, that would then lead you to surmise that we, our universe is part of what's called a multiverse. We can talk about that later. The technical logic that is really the, the core of the book is, if we saw these curling, twisting pattern of microwaves that we said we did, and we could attribute that to a true cosmic source, not just our galaxy, not just our sun or a lake or whatever, if it truly came from the cosmos, the early universe, then by force, that would lead us to believe inescapably that inflation, the spark that ignited the expansion of the universe that we believe it took place 13.8 billion years ago, took place. And then there are all these other implications after that. And I just wanted to find inflation real briefly because we haven't yet. This is this yeah. period early in the universe's history where it expanded at an exponential rate. Is that a relatively simple way to put yes, it? Yes, it expanded okay. exponentially and perhaps faster than the speed of light. Right. So it the was expansion a, could take place faster than the speed of light, even though no signals can be transmitted faster. And than we think inflation happened because it's inferred by what we see in the universe throughout the history when we look at the universe today and then, and then look at distant galaxies in the early universe, we can see that this is uh, probably put in motion by a period of inflationary right. expansion. There's a tremendous amount of circumstantial evidence that inflation took place from mm -hmm. the fine scale structure of these fluctuations in the microwave background that this doll represents, um, et cetera. These, these, um, the, the fact that the universe's curvature is non-existent, meaning that if you shoot two initially parallel laser beams out into space, they'll never converge as they might if the universe had too much matter, too little matter, they would diverge, for example. So there, uh, and, and there's, there are many other pieces of circumstantial evidence but there are competing theories that could explain all those phenomena, except they would not produce these waves of gravity. So then gravity waves, these waves of gravity become a very crisp test that would rule out the other models that are competitors to inflation. And then using a version of Occam's razor, you might be left to believe, to accept the fact that in combination with the circumstantial evidence, that these waves of gravity are the smoking gun that proves beyond a reasonable doubt that inflation took place. And that's why the excitement took place where millions of people tuned in around the world. We made this announcement on St. Patrick's Day 2014. Right. And so you were looking for a very specific polarization uh, signal that implied the existence or that inferred the in existence of these gravitational waves. And therefore, it, 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 as the theory goes back to inflate, that inflation did actually happen. That's right. And so you made your announcement, as you say, in, uh, on St. Patrick's Day. Everybody got excited, but yeah. then there along came uh, the Planck telescope, I believe. That's, that's right. And they yeah. also looked at the cosmic microwave background in very um, accurate detail. I don't know if it was as accurate as BICEP2 or not, but it certainly mapped the entire CMB and found that perhaps your conclusion about what you had seen isn't what you actually thought you saw. That's right. So as I said, the CMB is thought to originate from the formation of the elements, the elements hydrogen and helium primarily, and a little lithium and beryllium, etc. cetera. Uh, but it's not thought to be the source of all the other elements of which were comprised, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. So it could only produce the first few elements on the periodic table uh, if indeed it is correct. And we have uh, no reason to suspect it's not correct. In fact, we tested it extremely accurately. However, that being said, the CMB is not the only source of microwave energy that could be polarized and in fact have the exact same signal and signature, this curling, twisting pattern of microwaves called B-mode polarization for historical reasons. Uh, that, would be in, uh, that would be sort of the smoking gun that I just described uh, to, per, you know, that would all but shoo it, you know, make inflation a shoo-in for the theory of cosmogenesis. How did the Big Bang get started? 
And in that way, I think it's very important to point out that the best data that we had at the time indicated that the only other source of microwave energy, our galaxy, would pr that could plausibly produce a signal such as this, that there was no reason to suspect, based on what we knew at that time, that what we had seen was not what we claimed it to be, the, this imprimatur of inflation. And even though immediately after our discovery was announced, people started to say that we had seen imposter signals that weren't really real and that, you know, and we refuted those rather quickly, but there was a persistent concern that still we had not fully ruled out the contamination of what's called dust. And this isn't, you know, that much different from the dust that's, you know, probably covering your, your monitor or whatever uh, as you're listening to this. And it's really the, the remnants of previous stars that existed in the neighborhood of, the, of our solar system within the Milky Way galaxy. And when certain stars called type two supernovae blow up, they ex eschew and expel into the intergalactic medium particles of the last material that they're able to fuse, which is, which is iron. So if you've ever held a, a meteorite that's made of iron, here's one here, it has mostly iron, some cobalt, nickel. Uh, they, this is the last you know, product, so to speak, of a type two supernova before it blew up. And eventually that material coalesced and made our sun and our planets and the rocky inner core of the earth is made of iron. So thank goodness for that, uh, a star blowing up billions of years ago, about five billion years ago. For without it, we wouldn't be here talking. And in fact, some of the iron in the hemoglobin molecule in your blood originates from that very same supernova. So thank you, supernova. Yeah, However, really. <laughs> if you're a cosmologist, as you know, iron is highly magnetized. It can be magnetized very easily. It has a very uh, high magnetic permeability. And that means even in the Milky Way's feeble magnetic field, you know, many, many thousands of times weaker than, than a permanent magnet you can put on your refrigerator, uh, nevertheless, over billions of years, tiny grains of meteorites or much smaller versions of meteorites uh, called dust will tend to align themselves if they have an asymmetric shape. So this obviously, I've never seen a perfectly spherical meteorite in my whole life uh, that was naturally occurring. I have one at home that's a sphere, but, uh, but anyway, uh, so that means all these things could get aligned by the same magnetic forces and fields that align uh, magnetic compasses on Earth, say. And those could produce a polarization signal that could mimic the signal that we saw. And that was the conclusion that we were led to believe after the 2015 joint working together of the Planck team with the BICEP2 team. So we put down our, our you know, swords and we made plowshares and the plowshares dug up a lot of dust and the dust was in the form that we could not escape because we're embedded within the Milky Way. And so the only way to get rid of this signal is to build a new experiment that essentially only looks for dust. And then you combine that result with say BICEP2, which saw dust plus the cosmic uh, gravitational waves if they do exist. And then you subtract the dust only from the dust plus cosmic signal. And what you're left with should be primordial signals from the Big Bang. And we still have not uh, received enough evidence to say that we have detected gravitational waves in their purest form, which would again indicate inflation took place. So, so we're, we're hotly working on this project. So now there's a current version of BICEP called BICEP3. There's a new version, a fourth generation called BICEP Array. And then uh, I'm working on a new project called the Simons Observatory that are all building on these lessons learned that the dust signal that we ignored safely for decades in this field of research is now a sh very, very dominant force to be reckoned with. Wow. So uh, that is, uh, let me just take a break from this yeah. break here for a second. Okay. <clears throat> so I just want to take a break and say that my guest today is uh, Dr. Brian Keating. He is the author of Losing the Nobel Prize, a story of cosmology, ambition, and the perils of science's highest honor. Uh, he's also the chancellor of the distinguished professor of physics at the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences at the University of California at San Diego. Okay, Brian. So that is, to me, the story you've just told is a story. Okay. Maybe, maybe you did not have you come out with the result that you inspected but that this is still a story of science isn't it this is a story of how science works you've designed an experiment you've made some observations and uh you've calibrated your data you've taught you you've uh, published your results and then others have duplicated or at least done similar observations and refuted those results and came out with something as you said that wasn't so contentious that you both agreed that it's time to look a little bit closer at this and uh and and carefully to make sure that what we're seeing is what we think we're seeing. This is this is a this is how science works, isn't it? 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, people think of science, you know, as really neatly wrapped up, um, you know, that, that scientists dispassionately pursue truth and honest, you know, discoveries. And I, I'd like to think that we're, you know, very high uh, in terms of our ethical standards. And so we don't intentionally make mistakes. Um, you know, at least speaking for my colleagues and I, I mean, we didn't intend to do that. We did as best as we could in terms of asking our competitors for access to their data, which, you know, it turned out uh, they didn't have the data when we went to publish our, well, we didn't actually get it peer reviewed, but we released the data. And that, you know, we were rightfully criticized for, in my opinion. So science relies on the replication and the reproducibility of findings. It's not enough that, you know, you, Tony, make a finding and, and you're so brilliant that everyone just accepts what you did. Uh, because a lot of times, you know, I always say, you know, Einstein is reputed to have many blunders that he's made, including, you know, calling one his cosmological constant a blunder, which, uh, which uh, then eventually turned out not to be a blunder because it was discovered to actually be a real phenomena, uh, namely dark energy. And the cosmological constant seems to be, you know, the best guess that we have for how this dark energy behaves. But anyway, <clears throat> the, the discoveries that scientists make, and I always joke, you know, it's too bad because otherwise Einstein could have had a good career. But in the case of, you know, most normal scientists, we are frequently wrong. It's just that you're not wrong on such a public stage. And I think, right. The reason that people were so excited about our results, you know, fed into our desire to get there, want to get there first. And, you know, in, in retrospect, we would not have released the claims that we made um, uh, knowing what we know now. And it's, and it's a simple fact that when facts change, you have to change your opinion. And there's no such person or team or collection of people that are above the scientific method. Now, that being said, peer review is not a panacea. Pe peer review is not you know a guaranteed it's a necessary condition but it's not in no way sufficient i think you know replication is important and we had a lot of reasons to not want to you know uh to not want to do peer review before we did a release but one of the it was not because we had anything to hide it was more because we were worried about you know kind of the competition getting credit for a discovery that we made now we can talk deeper about why that way we were worried about that um, which, you know, spoiler alert, I think has, you know, at least in my case, has something to do with the Nobel Prize. Right. And I want to get to your book here in just a minute, but I just want to make a quick comment that that the scientific method, to the extent that it is, there is a method, uh, at its at its core, at its heart, is a human endeavor. And because of that, there are, it's full of biases and emotions and all kinds of other drivers besides just getting to an answer to your question. The exactly. stakes can be quite high in many of these uh, endeavors. And I think it was in the case of BICEP2. And certainly uh, many people had worked a long time on it. The interest was certainly there. Inflation as an idea, I'd love to have a whole hour just to talk about that, but we don't have time for that. It's just something that I, I personally wonder about, is it yeah. even a scientific theory just because of the fact that it applies to everything. But setting that aside for a moment, let's just turn now to your book. And this, this story that you've just told about your experience with, with the observations and the, uh, and the, and the synthesis, synthesis of the BICEP2 observations into a paper, uh, did it lead you into writing this book? Was it, or, or tell us a little bit about why you wrote your book. Losing yeah, the Nobel I, Prize. Yeah, I never thought I'd write a book. Um, as a kid, I'm, I was a voracious reader. I still am. I love reading science books, you know, the great science and science fiction authors. Uh, that really inspired me. And, and yet I didn't think I had it within me to write one, especially after writing a 200-page PhD thesis and supervising 10 PhD students. Uh, it's a lot of reading more than writing. And, and yet I realized that I had been a witness to something historical and in, in many fronts. One, this announcement. Two, coming very close to winning a Nobel Prize and not winning it. Uh, spoiler alert. Uh, and then uh, three, being asked to nominate the winners of the prize that I arguably was in the running for for several months uh, in 2016. And then uh, also wanting to tell the story of, of the origin of the universe from an experimentalist, from an observational astronomer's point of view. We have many of my brilliant colleagues, uh, Lord Martin Rees and Roger Penrose and, and Brian Green, all these people who are kind and generous and, and they endorse my book and put blurbs on the back of it. It's just so flattering to me. I read all their books and now they're writing something on my <laughs> book. Uh, but they're all theorists. Um, and there's nothing wrong with being a theorist. Some of my best friends are theorists. But one of my friends, Alex Filipenko, is an observer at UC Berkeley, who's the only person on both supernova teams that discovered the dark energy expansion of the accelerating expansion of the universe. 
he said that, yeah, he said a famous quote of his is that, you know, a theorist only has to be right once in her life to have her career made for forever. And an experimentalist or observer only has to be wrong once to end his or her career. Now I'm hoping my career is not over. I've, I've gone on to, to, you know, continue working and, and, um, and, and leading, you know, large, large teams. But the, but the point being that, uh, an experimentalist insight is one necessarily that has to grapple with real, real world effects. So, um, you know, Max Tegmark, a friend of mine, he can write a book about four different kinds of multiverses that none of which could ever be even possibly encountered, perhaps. And, uh, and you know, he can speculate on, on, on those things, but they can't be falsified. They can't be disproven. The whole job of an experimentalist is not to prove stuff. Remember, I said our job is to rule out these other competitors to inflation. The same way that, you know, somebody, I think Isaac Asimov, one of my heroes, once said, you know, if you think the earth is flat, you're wrong. And if you think it's a perfect sphere, you're wrong. But if you think saying it's a sphere and a flat are both equally wrong, then you're wrong. In other words, <laughs> it's about refining and getting things down you know, further and further to closer to the truth and paring away the, the ignorance. And I hope that we're continuing to do that. But you're right. Scientists are human beings. But sometimes we don't perpetuate this, this myth that we, you know, we perpetuate a myth that we're superhuman deities. And I think the Nobel Prize has a huge, huge role in that. Uh, one of my heroes, another hero, Richard Feynman, he said something which, you know, on one hand is, is incredibly, you know, offensive, but on the other hand is, is probably true. He said, you know, a reporter asked him, what'd you get the Nobel Prize for? And he said, if I could explain it to you, it would be worth the Nobel Prize. Now, it's probably true he can't explain quantum electrodynamics to a layperson. Yeah, but a little bit condescending. Is, yeah, it's very <laughs> condescending. And, you know, it's totally within his character. Um, but, you know, he, uh, he's, he's in, in, in big company. And I would say that does science a disservice. Because imagine a kid, you know, imagine Richard Feynman at age 12 listens to that. And he hears, oh, you can't understand this thing that this brilliant person, maybe he wouldn't have gotten into science. Because he would say, well, I never make mistakes. So, uh, or I make mistakes, but scientists don't, so I shouldn't get into this field. And I think that does a disservice to the field of science by scientists. Yes. And so what, uh, another interesting point that you just brought up, and I want to dive into it a little bit more, is this idea of a, 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 theor a theorist can come up with an idea that mathematically is beautiful, makes a lot of sense. You use the multi-world, uh, multiverse right. idea. Uh, but an experimental observationalist, his job or her job is to try and provide evidence that among all of the theories that are out there, which ones are clearly not going to work according to what we see in the world around us. And of course, the process is never ending. Uh, things come and go. You can, you, you know, uh, observations can sometimes uh, bring other ideas back to the forefront. Yeah. But you have, it seems to me like the tone of your book is one of, there needs to be some changes in how science is done. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, what are your thoughts on the Nobel Prize itself and how does it hinder, you think, uh, the, the, the progress of science? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So <clears throat> in my opinion, what the Nobel Prize does is it turns uh, science into a sport almost. So this week is Nobel Prize season. That's right. I joke, I joke in the book that the Nobel Prize has all the characteristics of a religion. It has a founding father, you know, sort of a deity, Alfred Nobel. It has this mythology surrounding his death and his brother's death that I get into in the book. It's given out on the day of his death. In other words, it's announced during this week in October, but it's awarded on December 10th every year, which is the anniversary of his death. Um, and there are a lot of, you know, kind of eschatological aspects of the Nobel Prize. It, it has this kind of priesthood, uh, Vatican City almost, where it's the Stockholm City, uh, all these scientists, mostly <clears throat> male scientists in Stockholm and Sweden generally in the Nordic countries that are the high priesthood. It has its holy days, you know, the Annunciation Week that we're in now, and then it has the uh, Coronation Week in December. And then you literally bow down and receive a golden icon, a golden idol that pictures an engraven image of Alfred Nobel on it uh, while you're uh, dressed in this mandatory attire that they, that they force you to wear. So it has all these aspects of religion. And, and I don't know about you, but, you know, I'm very comfortable with my religious choices as I've made them. And, you know, if somebody comes to my door, a Jehovah's Witness, and asks me to, you know, consider another God or you know, whatever, um, I'm very reluctant to give that up. And I think scientists do that as well. They don't want to give up the Nobel Prize. Many of them are, are denigrated or comment on it because, it's sort of a goal for them. And, and many yeah. of them are, are secular, in fact. And, and this is, you know, some will say, oh, it's just good fun. 
But, you know, this whole week is just saturated by the Nobel Committee tweeting about stuff, putting out stuff, looking for likes, and ignoring the apostates. You know, every religion has apostates, and I'm kind of a, an apostate in the religion of Nobelism, as I describe in the book. And I so wouldn't I go that I, far. I mean, I, but I wouldn't say you're an apostate. I would, that seems well, hard. Well, I certainly want to, not, you know, like Martin Luther, you know, I'm not comparing myself in any way to him, but he wanted reformation. Right. And he, did, he didn't say tear down the church. He said the church needs to be reformed and maybe a new one made up. And I believe that the Nobel Prize, it's incumbent upon the Nobel Prize, lest it go the way of, of prizes that have come and gone over the centuries and due to things that it leaves out large swaths of the scientific community, notably women, minorities, groups bigger than three people, for, for, you know, for example. And so I think its days are numbered. If it doesn't, if they don't take heed to the suggestions that I, and I'm not alone, I mean, every single person, including members of the Nobel Academy, have written to me, have said to me that they agree with everything that I say in the book, but they're not going to change. And that's just they're ossified in this role because it brings a lot of prestige to them specifically. And there's no other prize that comes even remotely close in terms of prestige. And as and I have seen firsthand, I, I worked with uh, Adam Reese at the Space Telescope Science Institute, right. and he, uh, it you, the the change after he won, uh, he won the Nobel Prize for the Type One A supernovae work he did with uh, Saul per 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 Perlmutter, yeah. uh, with the Type One A supernovae, Brian and Schaefer. oh my God, the 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 celebrity status was, yeah. you know, it exploded. It was like suddenly he. I had lunch with him three months ago and at the Space Science Telescope Science Institute and you know there's this Nobel Prize a replica of it in the cafeteria yeah yeah and the uh, SDSCI really built that up and because they're obviously quite proud of it and, and, and institutions are are they want to attract the best minds and stuff so they right. they would definitely tout this kind of thing I also went to the University of Colorado when uh, uh, was it was it oh, I forget his first name but um, last name was Weiner is that right uh, the Bose Bose Einstein Wyman, found, Wyman. Wyman, thank you. Um, he won, and the same thing. He was suddenly a rock star. Uh, yeah. on I went there a month after, a month before I went to Space Telescope, and I saw a building there. And they said, "This is our new building. It's it was built by Wyman's Nobel Prize." All of, yeah, exactly. And all of this is to say that there is a huge um, industry behind this. And I think that's what the point of your book is. That's that fun. and, I mean, and it, is, it, you know, it's, it's it's thirteen chapters. Only three are about the Nobel Prize. The rest are about cosmology, a memoir, et cetera. But yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Well, this is this, and this was one of the main reasons I wanted to talk to you because I agree with you. I think that this is a that science, as a, an institution, is facing a bit of an inflection point. We're seeing, and we live in a time where uh, the scientific discoveries and the general public attitude about science is is faced a level of distrust that I have never seen in my lifetime. I'm not that old, but I, I mean, I. And, and I, I can tell you that there is a level of distrust in science that I find disconcerting. And I think part of it, not all of it, but part of it is this priesthood, I am so amazing and I know so much and you don't know anything attitude uh, yeah. in, in, among these. And not, they're not all jerks no, by any means, but, it, it, but it, it, prog it projects this, exactly. this level of otherness that is, if anything, it's certainly not inclusive. That's and right. So, and so... I don't know. You know. What are your thoughts? One of, one of the, yeah. So, I, you know, obviously I agree with you and, I, you know, just to make it a little bit more interesting so we're not, you know, mutually admiration society. <laughs> um, I'll say this. So I don't have any problem with anyone who's won the Nobel Prize. For example, when I got this letter, which I have in my office somewhere, uh, asking me to nominate the winners of the Nobel Prize after it said, keep strictly confidential. So nobody out there in deep astronomy land, no, don't mention this. You know. right. I, you know, I printed in the book, but anyway, uh, but, the, but the point is uh, they say you can't nominate yourself. Okay, so these people that win it, they didn't nominate themselves. They didn't get asked to win it. And, and nobody who's won it, you know, beyond, you know, has, has really gone through, you know, this whole process of getting prepared for it. Because I don't think you can prepare. Two weeks ago, I had dinner with Barry Barish, who's the winner of the 2017 co-winner of the Nobel Prize for LIGO. Um, you know, he said, we were so close to failing all the time. I never even thought about the Nobel Prize. He read my book. He loves my book. He said, but you know, he disagrees that it should be such a great focus. And I said, Barry, you have a little bit of what's called survivorship bias. Like you've been through it. <laughs> That's you right. it. You know, and so 
But when you go to these buildings like at NIST in Colorado, which I just mentioned, our space telescope, or you go to my physics department, which is named you know, Gephardt Mayer Hall, which is where, named after Maria Gephardt Mayer, the last woman before last year to win the Nobel Prize in physics, or you go to the corner of Nobel Street and Le Bon Street, which is Nobel backwards, here in San Diego, it's written into the street of a major city of America. Why is this? This is a prize given out by 400, mostly male, mostly you know, white males in, in, in Scandinavia. Why does it take on such importance? I think it's because of a carefully cultivated monopoly that this prize has. I mean, for example, the, uh, the Breakthrough Prize is three times as valuable if you win it, you know, it's 10 times as valuable if you share the Nobel Prize versus if you win the Breakthrough Prize by yourself, it's $3 million versus $300,000. And that's uh, the one that was done, that was created by the, was that the Russian guy? Yeah, Yuri Milner. Yeah. Right? Thank yeah. you, Yuri Milner, I forgot his so, name. So, you know, when we, when we look at these prizes, it's clearly, not, it's clearly not monetary. So it has to be something else, right? And that's why I make this case, you know, slightly tongue in cheek, but I do think it's real. When I teach classes, I often teach experiments that led to Nobel Prizes. When you look at the Department of Energy's website, you know, they touted they had a Nobel Prize as their secretary. When you go through uh, the National Science Foundation, they point to how many Nobel Prizes their research has given out. Even my foundation, the foundation that supports most of my research now, the Simons Foundation, they took credit, rightfully so, for funding it. Now, I make the analogy in the book, it's not the fault of the winners. It's in some sense the fault of, say, the funding agencies, the Swedish Royal Academy, et cetera, because they perpetuate it just as a Hollywood studio is funny. I was on uh, Scott Eastwood, who's Clint Eastwood's son. He has a lovely podcast called Live Life Better, and he came down, and interviewed me, and I was saying to him, "Look, Scott, you're in the entertainment world. You know, he tried out for you know parts and all these movies, and you know it better than anybody. Hollywood doesn't expect every you know crummy movie that's out there. Like, let's just take a movie like The Fast and the Furious. Nobody thinks that you know, kind of a caliber movie is going to win an Academy Award. But and he's like, excuse me, I was in The Fast and the Furious." <laughs> uh, uh, uh oh um uh, <laughs> sorry uh, uh, <laughs> it was a triumph of cinematography but I, he said i agree with you like it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't meant to win an academy award but it was meant to make the money that then goes to the moonlights and the and the um you know the other movies that do win academy awards that are seen by the square root of the number of people that see his movies right. so it's the studios what's the analog of the movie studios in science it's the funding agencies it's the universities like san diego it's it's the it's the publicity officers that, and the newspaper journalists you know we had this front page announcement headline above the fold in the new york times bicep discovery evidence for the smoking gun of the big bang there was never a front page art i don't even know if there was an article period in the printed edition when we retracted our conclusion. And right. that tells you something. People want to see these headlines. They want the likes, the favorites, you know, whatever, the retweets. Um, and it sets up this game competition that's very antithetical for the first time in history where science is kind of vetted first in the public and then by peer review and then by replication or not. Well, this is... The, oh boy, I, can, I really have a lot of other questions I want to ask you. And let me just on that, but, but I'll just stick to this topic real quick and say, what do you think in that same vein where it's all about the likes and it's all about, we got to get the exposure quickly because science is a very competitive endeavor. We need, it needs money to survive. It needs money to get things done. What do you think about the, the way in which archive.org is run now with specifically Astro PH. I, this is, for those of you who don't know, this is a preprint archive. When a, when a, a new paper is about to be written uh, many, many times uh, the paper, once it's been accepted into a journal, will we get pre the preprint will get posted there so you can read it. Um, I have discovered, and maybe you can dispute this or, or agree with me, but I have discovered on Astro PH especially that, there's a lot of papers there that are posted way before they're even accepted into a journal and not quite even peer reviewed. And have you noticed that as well? Oh yeah, we did it with Bicep 2's results. We posted okay. it on the archive, we posted it on our website. Yeah. And why did you do that? Well, in our case, we wanted to do that because we didn't want to submit to peer review because we didn't want to keep it embargoed. So many journals nowadays will force you in the biggest journals not to release your results on archive before they're accepted for publication in Nature. Uh, so you'll actually be forbidden to do that. And so then we would say we would submit it to Nature, for example. Then Nature, would, you know, there'd be a couple of peer reviewers. By the way, when there's peer review, you're talking about maybe a professor. Sometimes it's a postdoc. For this type of paper, it probably would have been a, a professor. But maybe it wouldn't be an experimentalist. We ran it by a couple of theorists, but we didn't run it by our competition. Because, you know, in some abstract world, we were worried about being scooped and people publishing. And there were actually, like, hundreds of papers. I remember, like, the night before, 
the leak was made by several dozen people probably, and there were all these papers published if the results from you know a gravitational wave looking polarimeter uh, would reveal this level of signal, then our model of how the universe formed would be right. And they, they, they were kind of angling for the theoretical component of the Nobel Prize in some cases. Um, and then still others were, were refuting it before it even came out. So I think there's this, there's this outdated notion that, 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 you know, kind of peer review solves everything. And there have been numerous cases where things have been published and then retracted um, after, long after the peer review process took place. So it's not a panacea. No. And in fact, I'll just add to that by telling you one little anecdote I had when I was still working in solar physics. I won't say any names, but there was a guy doing a peer review of another journal article to a competitor or someone he, he didn't think highly of and said that he had a lot of problems with the science, but was going to go ahead and recommend it for publication uh, because it, um, you know, he wanted to see this guy fall on his face. So there's, there's a lot of that kind of thing, which of course hurts science as, a, as an endeavor but as i said it's a human endeavor and there are all kinds of things pushing and pulling on our motives for what we do in science we hope that most of them are genuine and pure and want and and honest but there are plenty of times when that's not the case and, yeah, and i mean people scientists have you know needs just as anybody else does there's tenure there's you know right there's, there's 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 you know within your university there's a press office that's breathing down your neck we got to get this result out you know and then it's embargo and so all these things conspire at the worst possible time when you have the least amount of time well i and and so my my and i think all of this uh does a lot of harm that's this idea i've got to get it out there first i've got to get my likes and i've got to get the social media attention because in this day of social media what what's happened is that science journalists have caught on to the astro ph thing and now they scan the, they get the daily emails yeah. uh from cornell and they look at all of the, the, right. the pub papers that have been published and they click on the ones that have the titles that they understand halfway right. and then and they then they then they start doing it then you'll see it in you know, uh, I'm, I'm not picking on anybody in particular, but you might see it on Forbes or you'll even right. see it on like New Scientist or something like exactly. that. No, exactly like, right. So I call it, you know, kind of e hacking. I, I call it T hacking, you know, because <laughs> yeah. you're hacking the title. And so what, then what do they do? So they're, they're one of the good journalists, right? So they'll say, if confirmed, the multiverse is true, you know, and it's like the, the general audience reader is not going to, hmm, let me wait six months until Planck comes through. And then, no, it's the multiverse is true. They're winning Nobel Prizes. And I've had people still think, oh, didn't you guys win the Nobel Prize for that? <laughs> you guys win. You know, because of they, if, if the retraction is printed, it's on page B17 on the Saturday edition that nobody reads. Yep. So what do you think about um, the process as it stands now? Is there something better? Is there anything else we can do? Well, in terms of the Nobel Prize or in terms of science? I guess the, I'm, I'm thinking more broadly now into the way science is presented, the way si the currency of science is papers and the way discoveries are being announced right. and communicated. Is there a better way? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that there is, you know, if scientists can be, uh, for example, and, you know, we don't have too much time, but I will say this. All my friends that have gone to business school, law school, medical school, they take classes in ethics. We never take a class. I never took a, I don't know about you, but I never took a class in ethics of science. And it's not for lack of examples. It's not for, I mean, these things go back to like Galileo not wanting Kepler to have a copy of his telescope to replicate his results because he was afraid there was still more stuff that he could discover first in the low hanging tree of deep astronomical knowledge. Yeah, he he didn't want Kepler. He knew Kepler was a genius and would figure stuff out. That's so, right. Uh, Galileo was really bad about that. He, 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 took, was, people's, yeah. he took credit for other people's work, too. The credit for other people's work. He didn't admit poverty. <laughs> he disobeyed his funding agency. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That's a cardinal sin, you know. Plagiarize, fine, but no, I'm just kidding. Well, uh, Brian, so, I... Yeah. I I, I know I only have a few more minutes and I, yeah. I'm desperate to ask, talk to you about this one more uh, sure. topic. And that is as a cosmologist, and you've already mentioned Alex Filipenko, um, one of my heroes is Sean Carroll, who I think also works at Caltech. Yeah. And um, he has lately been talking about this multi-worlds theory, this, this yeah. multiverse idea, this idea that in quantum mechanics, 
the wave function collapses the minute you do an observe, observation of something and you're forced into whatever that wave function was whenever you observed it. But he is uh, going on the work of, of a physicist named Everett, I believe, yeah. who said, don't collapse the wave function, just let the universe be. And what the implication, and what are the implications of that? And he, and of course, the implications are that every time you make a decision, whether you decide to go left or right on a given intersection, whatever it is, the universe branches off. Uh, and now there's a completely different universe where you went left and right. And uh, there's a, basically there's infinite numbers of everything that ever happened. I have a problem with this on so many levels, but I don't want, while I don't want to talk about that, what I want to talk about is this idea of the demarcation problem, which is this idea that Karl Popper came up with about whether something is either science, pseudoscience, or just plain bullshit. Yeah. And in this case, when you have something like that's beautifully explained by quantum mechanics and mathematics that this could actually be true, but has zero hope of ever meeting an experiment that will confirm or deny it. My question to you is, is that science? Is it, yeah. is it science? If you I could... spent a good, a good half a chapter talking about this in the book in the context of the multiverse, which is, I should, I should make you feel even more, you know, angry because there's, it turns out that there's almost as many different kinds of multiverse and, and different kind of, um, you know, uh, second order scientific hypothesis as there are, you know, real planets in our solar system or, or maybe even more. And, and that's to say that there's, you know, kind of the, the general speaking multiverse where it's, there's, there's regions outside of our observable universe that we know exist or we believe exist the same way I believe when I'm out near Catalina Island that, that you know, Japan exists. Um, you know, but, but I don't know for sure because I can't see it. It's beyond my light horizon, right? My physical horizon. So in this case, that's the most basic type of multiverse. Then it goes all the way up to like string theory, um, the, the background number of vacua that you could have, inflationary multiverse. We could have, honest to goodness, big bangs going off right now, uh, currently in some abstract space. Then there's a multiverse in, in time where you have a cyclic universe that comes into and out of existence. And then lastly, or you know, perhaps in somewhere in the middle of an infinite number of multiverses, is this Everettian uh, quantum mechanical description of the multiverse where there are parallel universes going on in this abstract uh, Hilbert space or quantum mechanical space. Um, I, have, I have Sean's book. He did endorse my book, so I can't say anything like, no, I'm just kidding. I can say whatever I like. He's oh, no, I love him. He's, he's yeah. like a rock star to me. I'm not going to oh, say no, anything bad about him either. I'm just frustrated by this yeah. idea it, itself. I'm not saying... It is very frustrating. So, you know, in the book, I think early off, I, I, I have the audio book, and I believe, you know, he's talking about in the very beginning that, you, and I, you know, everyone should go out and buy his book and two copies of my book, but <laughs> his, uh, you know, these, these decisions, these inflection points are taking place, in his case, at the 10 to the minus 22nd of a second level. In other words, we're branching the universe wave function far faster than any picosecond, femtosecond, any sort of time scale, almost you know, like not too far away from, from like Planck times or, or, you know, the ultimate perhaps division of space time into time increments quanta. And for that reason, it may forever be untestable. Now, you know, he hasn't done like new research that's discovered that it's a matter of what's called the interpretations of the foundations of quantum mechanics, the measurement problem. There is a lot of work going on with that. I don't know if it's possible to construct an experiment that determines whether or not an interpretation of quantum mechanics like his is the correct one. My guess is like, you know, with many things, there could be multiple correct ways to approach it that may be non-overlapping. In other words, you may have, there might be aspects of, you know, free will and choice that depend or could be tantamount to an Everettian interpretation where the wave function is splitting and these universes exist. I, you know, that may not be as plausible as a, you know, Copenhagen interpretation, which basically everybody uses, but nobody likes. And so, um, and so this, this notion of the multiverse, I believe, you know, just on a personal level, uh, Karl Popper was correct about a lot of things. I don't know. I mean, his notion of what constitutes science is not as strong as say what Gödel proposed in mathematics. Agreed. where he had the incompleteness theorem and he showed that you can't construct a formally complete mathematical system. What we need in science is an analog of that. And Popper's definition is a nice working example, but I always point out Popper's two main bugaboos back in the 1930s were Marxism and uh, astrology. And if you look in any newspaper today, you'll find an astrology column. And if you look around the country at Marxist dictatorships, you'll find there's probably more of them than capitalist democracies. 
So he's been falsified in that context, as I like to joke as well. No, no, yeah, his falsification uh, ideas are are not complete. They're not enough, and and I and I don't endorse that. I was just he also just introduced the idea of the demarcation problem, like Correct. what yes. when is science science and when is it not science? And, and the thing valuable. is, if you tell me that we live in a universe where everything happened, uh, and we have no hope of ever. Um, knowing this for sure one way or another that's right. useless information to me exactly. that is just you know w w this is not this isn't really science you can say well we live in a simulation but we're never going to be able to figure it out i mean that's like well okay then why tell me this no it's science. that's not science that is science. meta science that is something yeah. else yeah. i won't say pseudoscience but it's not and in many cases it's just irrelevant i don't yeah. see i don't see what good that does anything and science to me by definition is something that advances our understanding of the cosmos in a way that is uh, testable that, that is yes that thank you that is testable that is something that we can build on to you know make you know understand things like gps's which is you know directly out of uh, yeah. Einstein's theory of relativity. So to me, that's science. And, yeah. and so this idea of multi-worlds and, and multiverses and even string theory, if things are happening smaller than the Planck length, which are laws of physics, as we can never measure anything shorter than that, then I don't, I don't see, I just don't see why we're even talking yeah. about it. Why are we wasting so much I agree with you. I, I do want our theoretical counterpart. That's why it's so important to have experimentalists on, by the way. Yes. Tony, my yes. Solution for doing that because we- You and me, man, observationalists. Yeah. I built- did, exactly. I built cameras uh, to yeah. to measure polarization of the solar corona. So I'm with you, man. Let's <laughs> awesome. let's let's do observations and let's back up. Let's throw away. Some, we don't need any more theories. What we need yeah. are observations to tell exactly. us which ones are bullshit. And we'll be doing much more of them. So look forward to that. Okay, Brian. Well, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome, Brian, to our. Oh. It looped. It was starting to loop, so I had to stop it. Well, okay. Well, that was it. That was how the interview ended. Um, getting really close to the microphone so you guys can hear me. Let me turn this up even more. Hello, testing. Okay. So that was uh, Brian Keating, Dr. Brian Keating. He is a professor at the University of California at San Diego. He's also the author of the book, Losing the Nobel Prize, A Story of Cosmology, Ambition, and the Perils of Science's Mightiest uh, Honor. And I will... Uh, there's a link to that in book in the description box. It's not an affiliate link. doesn't help deep astronomy, but it helps Dr. Brian Keating. So I hope you will check it out. So some stuff, some comments on this. Um, I have become at a point in this, my streaming career and also in my science communication career where I want to start talking a little bit more about the perils and pitfalls of science. Science is great. Science does a lot for us. I am a huge fan of science and I think it's important. We should always be fact-based and reality-based in our looking at the universe. However, I think too much um, gets swept under the rug with respect to how science is done, the politics of science, certainly the social interactions of science and the, oh, there's lots of gender issues. There's lots of good old boy syndrome, all of that stuff. And so what I liked about talking with Brian was that he's willing as a member of the community to discuss some of these issues. So we'll be back. Uh, he will be back on February 13th to uh, discuss this more live. He'll be here or on Zoom uh, to discuss like a regular old hangout. So for those of you who joined after the stream got started. Uh, this is now a thing. Uh, Astro Coffee will be happening by default every Tuesday or Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. The format will be different than it won't always be a discussion. Sometimes it'll be just me uh, with a prepared introduction. I'll talk about some, some astronomy stories that are going on. And on the weeks where there are guests, I will have them there. I've had to adapt to the fact that uh, Harley, Dr. Harley Thronson, who was helping me with Future in Space Hangouts and other and, uh, and the Footsteps to Mars Hangouts, has retired. Carol Christian has also uh, been able to. Well, she's willing to help, but we lost the funding to do the uh, Astro Coffees before, and she'll be back. She'll come when she has time, but she can't devote the kind of time that she used to. So I've had to adapt, and so the format of this stream will change a bit. So. Uh, I'll see you guys next Thursday, uh, and then Dr. Brian Keating will be back on February 13th, just before Valentine's Day, and I also, don't forget Tony's Twitch Tuesday, that's on Twitch, 
on Tuesday, <laughs> and it's Tony. So I love the alliteration. So I hope you join us. I w thank you guys for chatting. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, I just want to give a shout out to Launchpad Astronomy. If you are not subscribing to his channel, you need to. He's doing amazing work. So it's good to see you again. Uh, it's also good to see James Dugan back, Neil, all the Ryan, people that I don't see on Discord. Only see you guys there. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, uh, Brian, for that. I I appreciate it. Um, and yes, go and. Uh, oh, he's got a mailing list. He put it in the chat. I will also put that link in the description box uh, so that you can click on that as well And if you're watching it after the fact, uh, if you didn't get to catch this uh, stream live. All right. Well, please like this stream if you liked it. If you didn't, press like anyway. Actually, if you press dislike, it still gives me attention, so it's all right. Thank you also to... Um, you guys for supporting deep astronomy while you're here uh in the super chat uh, i do appreciate that so uh really everything you guys do helps me to keep doing this and so um i just want you to know very is, is very much appreciated uh don't forget to join our discord channel and um galaxia is announcing that there is a uh, is it is it a CFA talk? I forget the the place. The Center for Astrophysics talk on the first results from the Parker Solar Probe, which is an amazing uh, uh, thing they launched. Uh, it's now orbiting the sun, so definitely go check out that talk. I will see you guys uh, next week. Until then, thank you all so much for watching, and as always, keep looking up. <laughs>